Faith, the book of the week from last week that I'll discuss today is Social Chemistry by Marissa King, Social Chemistry, Decoding the Patterns of Human Connection. And so a lot of people, when I posted the book, I think they assumed that when it said social chemistry, it's something like the chemistry people think about when they're going on a date and, uh, you know, do we have chemistry, that kind of a thing. And it's not so much that that was uh, the focus of the book. Of course, it did talk about some aspects of interpersonal interactions and relationships. But I think the title is more along the lines of looking at um we all have a network of people around us, connections, friends, different types of relationships, but what can be different is how those relationships are arranged. So there's this analogy of saying graphite and diamonds both have carbon atoms, but it depends on how those carbon atoms are arranged that determines whether we're dealing with graphite, which is fairly worthless, and diamonds, which are the most uh, one of the most expensive um, types of uh, items or ingredients or I don't know, I guess you can call it a um, structural, uh, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, a property of something. Um, uh, anyway, <laughs> kind of blanking there. But so we have the difference between graphite and diamonds isn't anything about what's there. It's how things are arranged that's going to make that difference. So as she puts it, there are three main different types of of networks that people have. The first one that comes up is expansionists. And expansionists are people that have very large networks. So the way this is actually presented in a diagram is one circle in the middle, which is the person, with lots of lines connected to separate people. So um, they have a large network, they're well known, they might have uh, a good ability of getting to know lots of people, uh, but what can be an issue is that they might not have a lot of depth in those relationships, uh, and because of that, that can be an issue or trying to bring those people together. Then there are the brokers, that's the second type, and they are good at bringing together different people in different worlds. So they might know some people who are in a certain area of their life or work, a different type of area of people. They can be friends with these different people, kind of be an intermediary. That's where that term broker comes from. So they are good, especially in things when it comes to, in work, innovation, because they can bring people together from different uh, kind of walks of life or different types of people. And the last group are the conveners who build dense networks, and I'm reading some of this from the book. So in general, their friends are also friends. Some people like this when their friends are friends. Some people don't like that. Brokers tend to like to keep things separate. Uh, but their uh, advantage, conveners, is that they can build trust because one of the ways we build trust or people can trust us is often if they know someone who also knows us. So if you just know one person, you're not sure what to think of them. But if you know they have friends and those friends are friends and they all like this person, that makes you feel more comfortable trusting them. And so conveners tend to be able to have more trust uh, in their relationships because of that. So you can ask yourself which one of these threes, expansionist, broker, convener, the best describes you. While you should also keep in mind that these things aren't some kind of hard and fast thing like your eye color, which if you are one of these, you're only that thing. Rarely is one person going to purely be any of these types of uh, or have any of these types of networks. Uh, and also, you might actually see that in different areas of your life, you might have different types of networks. And on top of that, throughout your own lifetime, you might have different types of networks. So as she talks about in the book, when you are younger, especially in a professional sense, it can make sense to be an expansionist, meaning that you have lots of different contacts and lots of different areas because you're trying to still figure things out and you don't want to close any doors and you want to try to be connected to as many people as possible to see what options you can have to learn from people and all of that. As you get older, it might make sense to condense your social network or even your professional network. So it might become a little bit smaller and you might become either a broker or convener depending on who you are in different aspects like that. So 
that's something to keep in mind that it's not this, you know, I am a this and that's all I am. It's it's more complex than that. But you might notice that your network might, you know, be different types of ways. Uh, what's interesting is things like, you know, they ask questions, um, something like, where did you get your last job or how did that come about? And very often what they find is that people their last job, they didn't get it from um, just applying. Some people do, but about half of people got it through someone they knew. But when you ask them, it's not it's like a really good friend. That happens sometimes. But usually it's kind of like a friend of a friend or a friend of a friend of a friend, like someone kind of related to them. So this can be the power of what they call weak ties. Um, this came up in that book, Change, by Damon Santola, which I talked about a few weeks ago, uh, where I saw that was the first time I saw weak ties discussed in detail. But sometimes there's a power or strength in weak ties for things like that, that someone who knows someone who knows someone might be able to get you a job. And so that's actually how a lot of times things happen. So, you know, it's not again that one of these types is better than others, but it's understanding the pros and the cons uh, of these different types of uh, networks and then looking at who you are and also you might want to integrate or incorporate other aspects of the other types of networks based on what you're realizing is missing in your life or what you might need in your life whether it's personal or, or professional so for example the expansionists it could be nice to know so many different people uh, but she shares a story of uh, Shep Gordon who is this he became a very well-known uh, manager for talent especially musicians and he knew so many people and everyone liked him uh, but there was this one point in, in talking about his life where he was very sick and in the hospital and the only one by his side was his assistant and even she thought wow I'm the only one here uh, and I'm paid to be here I, I work for him and so sometimes there is this sense that even though you have a lot of people you're connected to, you actually are not very close with them, and that can be uh, problematic. So I thought that was interesting. So it talks about different types of networks. Now, she focuses on networks versus networking. And so networking is something that, you know, even for me, kind of brings this uh, icky feeling, like not a great feeling about, ooh, like networking. It sounds like you're schmoozing with people solely with the intention to see what kind of connections can I make to benefit me in the future. So something they would call instrumental networking. So you're going to meet people to see if they can be of some kind of benefit for you professionally. Maybe they can become a client, they can introduce you to client or other contacts to get you a job, a promotion, some kind of work. And so people tend to have a bad feeling when, when they do something like this. It's interesting some of the ways they try to measure how we feel. So she shared um, a series of experiments and one of them included asking people to reflect on a time either they did regular networking or some kind of an event versus instrumental networking. So again, that type of uh, networking where you're trying to make a connection in order to benefit yourself. And then they had them rate uh, how much different items were worth, like the price of different items, and they rated cleaning items more highly if they had thought of this instrumental type of uh, networking, which we could say is because, or the authors concluded, is because they felt kind of dirty doing um, what they were doing, uh, you know, networking in that way. And so we value something that cleans us better. And there's all sorts of studies like this where you might think, well, how are those things connected? Where if people even do something immoral or think of something immoral, they're more likely to use hand sanitizer or more hand sanitizer. Now, those studies must have been done pre-COVID because we're all basically showering in, in hand sanitizer these days. But uh, in those days, they could use that as a, a pretty good measure of how dirty people felt. And uh, Another example of how we tend to think of things as so separate, physical versus emotional versus moral versus, you know, feeling, um, let's say dirty, but there seems to be a lot more of these connections, which I think can be quite fascinating. So people tend to have this bad feeling about networking. Uh, but as the book points out, it's less about networking and looking at your network. And we all have a network, whether you want to think about it or not, or whether you think, um, you know, it's something you like or you dislike. It doesn't matter. It exists, whatever your network is, just like your social life exists. Now, whether you put effort in it or not, that's that's up to you, but it's there. So I think she brings up a good point 
in that we need to look at or be aware of our networks and to see how does it benefit us or not. And related to that and looking at the, the connection with our social life, what I thought was interesting is, you know, we have this negative feeling at times about networking, but we could say the same thing about friendships. If I tell you, put more effort into your friendships, sometimes people get this feeling like, oh, no, friendships should just happen naturally. I shouldn't be trying to do something. Shouldn't it just be something that happens organically uh, as if they're going to sell your friendships at Whole Foods? But there's this feeling like it should naturally happen. But the same thing is true. If you don't put effort into your friendships, they're going to die, which is kind of true of any kind of relationship. When I work with uh, uh, couples, I usually tell them, look, your marriage, you have to look at it as your first child, especially if they're thinking of having children in the sense that, yes, you're going to have this physical baby that you always have to take care of and be responsible for. But if you don't look at your relationship like a child, as your first child, like any living thing, it's going to die if it doesn't get time and attention and doesn't get what it needs. So our relationships need work and need effort, which a lot of times means we have to become conscious of what we're doing or how we are uh, dealing with whatever it is that we're talking about. If you just think, oh, relationships should just work out. If we love each other, we should be able to, you know, keep the love alive and all that. No, it's not that simple. And so uh, our friendships are the same, but then also our networks are the same. So it could be important to think about your network, not as this icky thing, but as this real thing. And one of the ways you can get over that, which I thought was interesting, is uh, focus on what you can give when you're networking. So rather than just focusing on, oh, what is this person going to give me? Or if my, am I going to get some new business out of these connections that I'm going to make today? You can actually focus on what can I provide or give to the people that I'm going to meet with as well. And give doesn't mean, of course, just money or something like that. You can be time, resources, connections, ideas, all sorts of things. But they actually found that when people thought about what they can give when it came to a networking opportunity, they tended to feel much better about what was going on. And she talked about something called the helper's high. Um, and so some fMRI scans showed that when we give, we light up the same parts of the brain. Sometimes I know when we talk about the brain that way, it simplifies it in a way, but it does seem to involve areas of the brain that are activated when we eat ice cream or receive money. So uh, that's what they call the helper's high. It's actually like you feel really good. And I think every one of us probably has felt that at some point, how good it feels when you give something that is useful to someone else. It feels really good. And so the brain shows us that. So it's maybe not surprising to see that. But so when people were told that when they were networking to consider what they can give, they felt much better about the process. It felt less dirty or icky to them. Um, we got to go to a commercial break, but after the break, I'll continue discussing the book Social Chemistry by Marissa King. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Continuing the discussion on the book Social Chemistry by Marissa King. Social Chemistry Decoding the Patterns of Human Connection. And so a lot of the book does focus on networks and kind of network science uh, and those aspects of our lives, which, which was for me newer things, which I'm glad I learned about. Actually, the other book, um, uh, Change by Damon Santola also focused a lot on network science and they cited similar authors and similar studies. That's something interesting when you read these, um, different books that I get to do every week, very often you'll see the same studies. Uh, sometimes I even can anticipate which um, which uh, study might be being discussed soon, which is a good and a bad thing. Well, good, I feel good to sometimes be able to predict what studies might be coming up. But sometimes the bad part could be is that if we're all talking about the same thing, sometimes we might not evaluate the information as much because we just take it as a given. This has actually happened a lot of times in uh, even psychology with some psychology experiments. Once they become like a classic, we take the conclusions of that study as some kind of a truth when at times there, there might be more to what's going on or that study might have had some uh, variables that were not being accounted for and now we take it as a truth. So just something to be aware of, something I, I 
try to pay attention to, but often it's interesting. Uh, you'll see the same studies come up time and time again in, in different uh, books. Nonetheless, moving on, you know, there was a lot about networks, and a lot of it had a professional slant to it, not only, but a lot of it did. But there was sections about our interactions with one another, which I thought was interesting. It, I think my favorite chapter was chapter 7, In the Moment. And it started off by talking about a performance artist named Marina Abramovich. And an uh, interesting type of performance art or art installation that she did at MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Uh, I forgot the year, but nonetheless, uh, during that time, what she did was she would just sit three feet apart from people and uh, just stare at them in the eyes no talking, so both people had to be silent, and she would just kind of breathe slow and just be with them. And so you might be thinking, what what is that about? How is that something that someone's going to sit quietly with you in silence? So if I think for a lot of people, it sounds like she was doing nothing, but over 1,500 strangers, people she didn't know, uh, actually wanted to go through this experience, and there was lines of people wanting to go through this, which is kind of interesting because you can think, any one of us could do this and actually I might kind of touch on this maybe we should be doing it with our loved ones uh, but it to me was quite fascinating I didn't know about this so um, she would just sit there in silence and people had these incredible experiences and so you might wonder what do you get from someone just sitting um, in silence even many people cried people laughed some people you know as it says put their hands on their hearts they had these really uh, amazing experiences just from someone sitting there, not talking and not really listening because they weren't saying anything, but making you feel seen, which is quite meaningful, magical, and powerful. I don't mean magical in some kind of like uh, surreal sense, but that it has such an amazing feeling and something that we don't experience that often. And so we have this interesting paradox as human beings so many different paradoxes that we have to balance, which I think is one of the challenges of life. But this one is that we want to be seen. There is a very strong desire to be seen for who we are, appreciated and loved for who we are, for someone to actually kind of penetrate our masks and see us for who we are, which of course means we have to show it to them, or we hope that they can maybe see through how we are feeling, even with us telling telling them that. Uh, so this is a classic thing. I've even experienced that, that, you know, usually when you see people, you say, how are you doing? And people say good. But I don't know if you've ever had the experience. I know I have when you're actually not feeling that good and you tell someone good, but they say, hey, you know, I know you told me good, but it seems like you're you're not doing all right or something's up. And it doesn't feel great in a way you might feel uncomfortable because now you're kind of going into a vulnerable space. But there's a nice feeling about being seen. And so from childhood, we have this need and this desire to be seen for who we are. But the paradox comes that there's also a fear and a vulnerability that comes about, or a vulnerability, a fear because of the vulnerability when we are being seen. Because what if we're being seen and the person doesn't like what they see or they somehow reject what they see? That feels really, really bad and that's scary. And that's part of why we tend to wear masks and to not be ourselves because it's a little bit scary that if I show you who I am and you reject that, that's very painful. So I think, you know, when it comes to wearing masks, it has two benefits in a way, benefits that I don't think are in our best interest long term, but at least overall in the moment it could feel better. One is, well, if I wear a mask and kind of be what I think is cool or other people think, you know, what I think other people will like or is more lovable. But there's also an interesting one that I think people don't think about, which is that if you reject me and if I only show you my mask, then if you reject that, then I don't think you've rejected me at my core. So it's an interesting way that it's also protective in that sense as well, that you can't reject me because I haven't shown it to you. And so that's this fear that if I do show you who I am, um, you, you could reject that or you could love that. And if you do love that, when I show you that, that's when we have that intimate emotional bond and connection that is so meaningful and really what we're striving for in relationships. But that risk to be vulnerable is not easy. But so going back to this, um, you know, what Marina Abramovich did, 
She was sitting apart with people with their eyes open, looking at one another, and um, people had these amazing experiences. People just felt seen and understood in a way that was quite remarkable. And, and so it brings up this notion, as I was saying, of having these type of connective moments with each other. So they talk about um, how some psychologists uh, will refer to high quality connections, these types of moments like this of just sitting and staring at one another and really think about that when was the last time i mean not even for an hour but just even for a minute or a few minutes have you ever done that of just sitting in silence with someone and staring them into their eyes i think most people will never experience that unless they're doing some kind of exercise like this or there was that um, 36 questions to fall in love with anyone which was brought up in the book and afterwards people would I think stare at each other for four minutes um, so I know some people did it during that but in general people don't do that and I've actually recommended this to many couples I work with to just sit sometimes I'll give them even one minute or two minutes if it seems like it might be too much to just sit and, and look at each other and try their best, not that you can't smile or laugh, but just to see if you can sit there in the silence. And it might seem easy. You're like, okay, how hard can it be to just sit and be silent? But it actually can be very hard for lots of people. So a few things happen. Sometimes people will say things, oh, we laughed so much because we have so much fun together. Or people will say, uh, we started to touch or get sexual because we're so attracted to each other, uh, which sound like good things. Like they're making it so like, oh, it's because we're so close and so good that this happened. But actually what really is usually happening in those cases is they're not they're lacking in some type of emotional intimacy and comfort to actually sit and do nothing with each other, to just be there with each other, which again, should seem simple, but it's not. And if we take a step even back, if you wanna call it that, being with ourselves even is not that easy. This is why meditation can be so challenging for people. Again, it sounds like something where we're saying kind of do nothing, just sit with your thoughts. But it could be so challenging to just sit with your thoughts because then you have to feel all the things you're feeling, have the thoughts that maybe you're trying to avoid come to your mind. And even being with ourself is not that easy. And so similarly, sitting there and just being with someone else is not easy for us either. And so when I've worked with some couples, some have a very hard time sitting in silence with each other. And so I encourage them to do this a little bit more, not that it's some kind of cure all or it's going to create the emotional intimacy you need to make your marriage survive, but it can be a good exercise of creating some more emotional intimacy or also just paying attention to what feelings come up. Um, some people have a hard time. I mentioned there's a lack of that emotional intimacy and comfort with each other. Other things that can happen is, going back to what I was seeing, saying, if you're afraid to be seen, that you're going to see me as not good or that I'm ugly or defective or something bad, unlovable about myself, then I'm going to have a hard time with you just sitting and looking at me. So doing something, joking, touching you, doing something like that, it's not so much that I'm being fun and playful or I'm so attracted. It's actually because I'm having discomfort with being seen by you. So it can be, again, not necessarily a good sign or usually isn't a good sign if you can't just sit with that person. So I thought that was interesting, the art installation of strangers sitting with one another. But it's something to consider. Do we have these types of emotionally connected moments? It doesn't have to just be through sitting in silence. But in general, do you have that kind of experience with your loved ones, especially if you're in a romantic relationship? Most people would say no. Uh, or, you know, I deal with a lot of couples where they say, well, we're together all the time. But they're together all the time and they're most of the time both on their phones, watching something on Netflix, which sometimes is a shared experience, but it's a little bit different. Or they're just next to each other, especially this last year with the pandemic. People were physically together a lot of the times, but they weren't necessarily emotionally together and connected. And there's a big difference. And we shouldn't just assume that because we have physical closeness, there's an emotional intimacy that is there you can have a complete lack of emotional intimacy even if you're together 24 7 so I thought that was very interesting uh, and related to that in the same chapter there was a lot about listening which I think is a, a very important um, aspect of our relationships I had the same feeling today when I did the clubhouse room that I was talking about listening and then I was talking <laughs> not listening to anyone most of the time uh, but coming back to listening you know, um, 
it's another way that people sometimes think what I'm doing is not uh, that important or it's not that uh, meaningful. Just listening, how important can that be? But really, going back to not being seen in the same way, listening is a way of being seen, being heard. Uh, most people don't feel listened to most of the time. They don't feel like someone is really hearing what they have to say. And so in the book, she even talked about this in a way, but not quite like I'll talk about it now, um, about people trying to become better listeners, which I think is good to focus on that. But the most important thing in being a good listener is to care. And so you'll see a lot of you know things. People might post something on TikTok or Instagram or even in a book, but about how to it's almost like they're saying how to look like a good listener or how to make people think you're really listening. So they'll say, if you say, uh-huh, every 18 seconds, if you nod like this up and down, that's going to make them feel like you're listening. If every so often you mirror and repeat their sentence, they'll think you're listening. And all of those things are true and genuine, generally what people do when they're listening well. But the problem is the most important thing is that the person genuinely feels like you care. And that's almost always going to come across. And there's no replacement for that. I can't, you know, make it seem like you care if you don't care. And so if you want to be a good listener, one of the first things you need to do is to genuinely care and be curious about what the person you're talking to is going to have to say. And to be doing it with a non judgmental mindset and approach and not focusing on what am I going to do as far as giving them advice or fixing them uh, or fixing what's going on. So it, it's not so much that you do certain things and you're a good listener. Yes, there's certain things that make sense having some kind of eye contact, um, you know, saying, uh huh, is usually part of what people do and nodding and asking certain questions, especially follow up questions to what they're saying to explain more what they're talking about. But I think if you don't care, you're not going to be a good listener. And that's something you can't just fake. You can work on caring about people more um, in lots of different ways from, let's say, therapy, but also there's things like compassion meditation that helps you expand the network of people you care about or have compassion for. Um, but really, to me, there's no replacing genuinely caring about people. And so if we want to be good listeners, we have to be aware that first, you have to focus on that. But secondly, you have to genuinely care and be curious and want to understand what the person is saying. So I thought that was uh, interesting and important to look at that. And she shares research showing how meaningful and powerful it could be things like that. So again, we might think, well, I'm just listening. That's nothing. But that's really sometimes everything. And that's sometimes the only thing we can do. Most of the times when people come to us with something they're going through in life, especially if it's significant, there's nothing we can do about it. They lost their job. Maybe you can help them find a job. Sometimes you can't. Someone in their family has died. There's nothing you can do about that death. The only thing you really can do is listen. And that is very powerful. And you know, when I was hearing this part, there was a listening and another part was about physical touch. So there's research showing that when um, people are in pain so uh, you know they're showing like husbands and wives and i don't know why they chose the wives to experience pain but they were going to put some heat on the woman's forearm that was going to cause pain and if they were holding hands their brain of the person who was in pain the woman and her husband were synchronized in a way and so to me these things of listening and even this way that we touch and and support one another there's a way that we are carrying not that we really can change what the person is going through um, but we are carrying some of the emotional burden for the other person and that's why I think listening can be important and that's why giving people support in that way can be important and that's also why it could take a little bit something out of us to listen with empathy. So as a therapist, I've experienced this and any therapist knows, and we have to be aware of things like burnout, that if you're not careful 
paying attention to the impact that's being had on you to hear the stories to empathically be there for people um, it's going to take a toll on you whether you recognize it or not part of caring I think this is kind of speculative in my mind of thinking about it out loud with you as I was reading the book these thoughts came to me is that we're carrying a little bit of that load I'm, I'm sharing it with you let's say I don't take it from you but maybe I share with you that burden momentarily at least which might make it a little bit easier doesn't take it away completely and it definitely doesn't mean I've taken away the thing that is hurting you but it could mean that it's gonna make it a little bit easier for you to carry this burden carry this pain so a lot of the ways that we think well I'm not doing anything if I'm listening or why should I just listen I can't do anything about it it's actually oftentimes the only thing but the most meaningful thing that we can do so I thought that was interesting too, that whole chapter but you know, the rest of the book gets into different things like, um, you know, it includes the, the importance of mentoring, which I thought was important. Also looking at how you separate your work life and your home life. So there's segmenters who really separate things. And then there's integrators who there is more of a blend. And segmenters usually have a better work life balance, but some people are more integrators and they want that. They want there to be work friends that they have that they also see outside of work or to bring their family to um, work events and things like that. Again, it's not necessarily there's a one right, one right way to do it, but you have to see what, what works for you. But, you know, I thought it was interesting, but like, I didn't know exactly what to expect. Uh, I thought it was going to be only focused on the networking, but those chapters I mentioned later on in the book that included things like uh, interpersonal relations, I thought was interesting. Um, so I, th I found it pretty interesting books. I hope you will check it out. Social Chemistry, Decoding the Patterns of Human Connection by Marissa King. All right, we'll be right back. Welcome back. Uh, I know I'd mentioned that I was concluding on the book, but wanted to talk some more um, about um, the book and one specific thing about working in groups and teams and so you maybe have heard research saying things about how uh, diversity is good for groups and so that that does seem to be true um, and now when people hear diversity we sometimes think it's like oh it's just if people are from different races the group is going to do better and that's not exactly what is going on what really makes the contribution to groups having diversity is not necessarily just that they're from people from different races or sexes or sexual orientation it's if they're bringing different perspectives to an issue so especially if we're talking about um, something that's related to innovation or doing something together we want to have different perspectives because what happens is so so here's the thing when people think the same it is a little bit faster to get through things, right? So imagine even like you're trying to have a group and if everyone is Iranian and you're trying to have meetings to talk about something, they might all follow the same social customs. Uh, probably the meeting will start a little bit late because everyone kind of gets there a little bit late, uh, but everyone kind of knows what to expect about the social norms and things like that. But if you have, let's say, a, a group of Iranians and there's some people from different cultures, it, it might make things a little bit less smooth at the beginning because there's different expectations, different norms, things are different ways. But the benefit comes from not seeing things the same way, which is what's involved in creativity. And it's also what's involved in not having too many biases or seeing things a certain way. So if you have a bunch of, you know, Iranian people who all share the Iranian culture and traditional sense, there's certain assumptions that they will have that they don't even realize are assumptions. And that's the, the tough thing about biases is that we don't see them. Um, the only people who think they're unbiased are people who are blind to their bias. So if you have a group of people and they all see things the same way, they're just going to think, yeah, this is the truth. We all see it that way. You see it that way. I see it that way. Okay. We found the truth. But unfortunately, what they're not going to be aware of is that they are all sharing the same bias in what they're experiencing. But what would be beneficial is then if there's someone else there, that person having a different perspective might not share that same bias. And so as a result, they could bring a way of thinking differently, which again, at the beginning might make it a little bit less smooth, but overall will benefit the group and what they're going to create. Um, Naomi Oreskes in her book, Why Trust Science, uh, for me, was very interesting. She was saying, you know, 
It's not that scientists are unbiased. Actually, scientists are definitely biased. And we see this time and time again, that uh, even when there's new information and data or a new theory that better explains some type of a you know physical property or reality, scientists are slow to accept this new thing because they have their own bias. They see it a certain way and they're like, no, this is the way it, it has to be. As some of my biases I've you know, maybe I'll share them today, if not in future shows, some ones I've become aware of and I'm trying to, um, you know, challenge in a way. But so what she explains in that book is that it's not that scientists are unbiased or the scientific method is this pure thing that if you follow it, it you know, you're never going to have any biases. No, it doesn't work that way. But the way she explained it that to me was eye opening was what we hope is that we have a bunch of people that have biases, but a bunch of different people with different biases, and we kind of average them out, or if everyone is kind of keeping each other in check, we're more likely to create an unbiased um, sum total or result together. So if we all bring, we might have our own biases, but if you can see it from a different perspective, I can see what you're thinking in a different perspective, together, the 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 whole culture of science or the community of scientists can come to a better or a closer approximation to some kind of truth. Again, we never will fully achieve that truth or know everything, but we can get closer to it the less bias we have and the more different perspectives we have, uh, the closer we can get to it. So I thought that was an interesting thing. And, and even still, it's not that, okay, we have diversity. We're not going to have uh, you know, we're going to be unbiased now. No, we might still get stuck in certain things. Even science will have a certain culture or way of doing things that then needs to be looked at and evaluated again. So we always have to be vigilant and aware and try to be more self-aware about our biases, but it can be helpful to have different perspectives. So in that sense, what makes diversity help? Because I know Diversity is one of those buzzwords and people will say, oh, diversity is good for everything. And people are just, you know, they say it in a way and people just say, oh, come on, you're just saying diversity just because, you know, it's like the woke thing or the progressive thing to say. But how does it actually make things better? But the way that it makes things better in this sense, when you have a team that's working together, is that when you have these different perspectives, that can bring something. So it's essentially that women let's say, and men still in society might experience different things and go through life differently so that if they then come together to discuss an issue, they might bring different perspectives. But if everyone was treated essentially the same or equally, it would be less meaningful in a way. So um, part of what makes diversity still uh, meaningful is that we do have different experiences based on who we are. Different cultures also just have different approaches to different things, different norms, values, perspectives, um, and that can be helpful. And this is actually why being bilingual at times, or one of the findings that people who are bilingual, they actually can be better at taking different perspectives, at times can be better at creativity, um, better at being empathic or feeling empathy because just the process of learning two different languages and sometimes we think well language is just translation this word is for us and that word is for them and that's it but we know that language is more than just that because within language even sometimes is embedded certain perspectives or ways of looking at things or valuing things. So we can see that diversity has its value, not just because it's cool to have people from different ethnic groups together to look good or to look woke or to, you know, put a catalog out that makes it look like your company is progressive, but actually it's having these different perspectives makes us so that we're less likely to get stuck in our biases and not realize what we're not seeing. You know, we can't see what we can't see, but someone else from a different perspective might be able to shed some light on that. Uh, another, uh, you know, aspect of teams that she focused on in the book, uh, this is again, Social Chemistry by Marissa King, is something called psychological safety. So, you know, she shares the story of a, a plane um, and one of the engines goes out or catches fire and the, the pilot announces, okay, I'm going to turn off the right engine because it's on fire and we're going to make an emergency landing. Now, certain members of the crew or even one of the passengers in the back of the plane, they notice that the pilot has it backwards. He thinks it's the right engine, but it's actually the left engine that's on fire. And so by turning off the right engine and leaving this left engine on fire, it actually is going to jeopardize the plane and it likely won't do well. But because there's such a hierarchy 
on planes, or there was at this time, that the pilot should not be challenged and that the people below him, uh, it was a him in this case, should not challenge what he's doing. No one said anything, even members of the crew that were kind of like, wait, I think it's this, this is the wrong one. No one said anything, and I think something like uh, f 47 people, 50 people died on that plane, which maybe none of them should have died. Some people survived, which were able to share their stories, but it pointed to the fact that because of this kind of cultural sense of um, we shouldn't say anything to the superior, no one said anything, and it was obviously worse for everyone involved. And so the lesson here, and this shows up in different areas, even in the medical field and other fields as well, as well is you need to have a space in a group where everyone can feel comfortable to voice their opinions and everyone can feel that they can actually admit a mistake without, you know, you know, some mistakes, of course, matter it doesn't mean there's no consequences, but that I shouldn't be afraid to cover my mistake, because if I, you know, get caught, I'm going to lose my job, I should actually be uh, encouraged to share a mistake, because it's going to prevent things from getting worse. I remember one story of one of the worst cases of like, fraud or some kind of a uh, it was in England where some like um, financial institution someone made a small error but he was so afraid to share it that he kept trying to cover it up and kept losing more and more money to I think the company then lost millions or billions of dollars with some huge scandal but it, basically it came down to he was afraid to admit that smaller mistake and rather than it going away it just became something bigger so when we have psychological safety in a group, it means that we can feel comfortable to voice our opinions. We're not afraid that if we make a mistake, you know, we're going to be uh, punished horribly for it or something bad is going to happen. And I like that she, I don't know if she said it herself or she shared someone else's thoughts on this, that the word psychological safety, it sounds like this, you know, safety, it brings up safe words, a safe space, and it makes you feel like these these types of teams are warm and cuddly and, oh, it doesn't matter what we do, it's okay. And that's not the case at all. Actually, psychological safety means um, we're going to be honest with each other. We're going to be open. So in a way, it's actually uh, confronting some of those things we think of as safe, meaning that everyone should feel comfortable, you know, don't say anything that someone else might not like. You don't say things intentionally to harm someone, but you say the truth. You say, I think actually this might not be right, or I think there's a problem here, rather than, oh, that person is my superior, I shouldn't challenge them, so I'm just not going to say anything. So in medical issues, you know, this is also a big thing where people felt like they can't challenge the doctor or the surgeon, even when they know something is wrong, and sometimes it's led to the end of life, or to amputating the wrong leg, and things of that sort. So it's not actually a weak thing psychological safety sounds again like a soft thing but it's actually hey we're going to be real and you're allowed to be real I want you to tell me when something is not right so rather than looking at it as something weak what we're actually saying is hey you know the leaders the ones that have the power you have to not be weak and be open to hearing criticism open to hearing that maybe you're wrong um, open to hearing that maybe you're making a mistake and sometimes maybe we're wrong to tell you you're making a mistake but at least you have to be open to hearing that and you should want to hear it so psychological safety rather than being this you know kind of kumbaya everyone just you know everyone's good and everything we do is good no it's actually to achieve you know efficiency to achieve success to achieve a positive output but we're going to be more open with one another we're not going to be afraid to speak the truth and this actually leads to better outcomes so sometimes we think about well, people should be afraid you know we, we try to use fear to make people do better but fear usually it could just work in the short term you know, if you're trying to really stop someone from doing something, you might use fear in that moment. But for anything longer term, fear usually gets in the way of things like being open, of actually even being creative. If you're afraid, you can't think very well or think very clearly. This is why when people have test anxiety, they feel like this threat, like something bad is happening, and all of a sudden they blank on things that they knew the night before when they were studying. All of a sudden, when it comes time to take the test, they feel like they can't think of anything. So um, to me, that was interesting. Again, I've seen this in a few of the books I've read recently about groups and what can make them successful. But psychological safety is one key component. So if you're on a group, 
if you have some power in it, especially, but even not think about that. Is there psychological safety in this work group that I have? And especially if you're someone who's creating the culture of a company, of a group, of a team, be mindful of this very important factor. How easy is it for people in the group to share their opinion? How comfortable do they feel? How easy is it for them to acknowledge a mistake, which will help us prevent bigger mistakes, help us learn from the mistake to move forward? Because if we we don't do that, we're ending up uh, with bigger issues. We're ending up not facing things when they happen, trying to hide what's happening in order to pretend like everything is okay. So I thought that was a very interesting point to present it, that psychological safety isn't something weak or soft. It's actually being honest, direct, and upfront and creating a culture where everyone can speak their mind and say what they have to say. So we're getting to the end of the show. Again, uh, people even during the Instagram Live have been asking about the book club. You can join every Monday. So I talk about the book at 8 p.m. L.A. time, 1 p.m. L.A. time on Clubhouse. If you join my group, Psych Talk with Dr. Farid, you can uh, then get the updates on the different book clubs. And I hope you'll join to, to join the discussion, have a conversation. It's been really a joy to do that so far these past few weeks. Looking forward to continuing that. All right. That brings us to the end of tonight's show. Uh, thank you to Amir here in the studio. You've been listening to In Session with Dr. Farid Alakwi. Have a wonderful night. Thank you.